Fatality! 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 What's going on everybody? Sean Ross here and welcome back guys to another review where I will be talking about and discussing chapter 175 of Tokyo Ghoul Re. And just like Naki stated in this chapter, we've got a shitload of stuff to talk with you about. Damn, Ishida, you are just breaking out your bag of sensu beans and tossing out those revives like they are candy to characters that we either presumed to be dead or to be missing from the story up until this point. We saw four characters return in this chapter. Arimi, Koma, Eto, and Naki. And just from talking with you guys in the comments of my live reaction, this is a very interesting chapter to say the least and kind of feels like a mixed bag depending on how you are viewing this chapter because the Eto fans right now are rejoicing for the return of their goddess for their queen and I am happy for them and I am happy too because if you're going to reintroduce Eto into Tokyo Ghoul Re, that panel was the best way to honestly do it. But then on the other side of things, you don't really see that rejoicing really coming from the fans of Naki. I am a big fan of Naki's character. I love what he has done throughout the story of Tokyo Ghoul and Tokyo Ghoul Re. But seeing his return in this chapter gave me very mixed feelings because I think many of us thought chapter 140 when we had his, you know, epic send off, you know, him going out in the blazes of glory that chapter thinking about Yumori and protecting his friends and comrades, that would have been the perfect send off for his character. And it kind of gets diminished a little bit getting to see him return in this chapter. But don't get me wrong, it's epic to see that final page with Naki leading the white suits up against the V organization. And if you thought having Eto and Naki return within this chapter was craziness enough, at the beginning of this chapter, we see the return of Arimi and Koma. The Black Dog and the Devil Ape return in this chapter after going missing during the underground arc. And they return as autonomous humanoid Quinkays, a new Quinkay technology that we are just learning about now, which honestly is leading us to assume that Arimi and Koma might have been dead this entire time. They might have died at the ending of part one, and ever since their reintroduction during the Rue Island arc up until right now, they have been under the control of the V organization, and that is crazy to think about. So overall, this chapter had many crazy surprises, weird and cool revelations, and just moments that made us go, what is going on right now? So there is a lot to talk about with chapter 175. I will start at the beginning of this chapter and work our way till the end. But the crazy thing to think about is walking into this chapter, we were expecting a full-on conversation to take place between Kaneki and Furuta. We open up this chapter to basically see that the fight between Kaneki and Furuta has reached its climax and is most likely done and over with. And this was to be expected considering that last chapter's cliffhanger, we saw Furuta getting cut in half or at least stabbed through by Kaneki's Kagane. And when we come to see the state that Furuta is in, he looks defeated, even though he has this trollish grin on his face as he is disheveled and bloodied staring back at Kaneki. But he's singing this children's song to Kaneki to where he states, the bird in the cage, when oh when, will it come out? Which is a nice reference to the bird cage, which has been mentioned over the course of this series many, many times. But the odd thing was, this section with Kaneki and Furuta only lasted two pages. We had one normal page and then a double page spread with side portraits of Kaneki and Furuta just staring back at each other. And the only line of dialogue that we really get is from Furuta to where he states to Kaneki, Associate Special Class, do you ever think it was all in vain? When I first read this question in my live reaction, I kind of interpreted it as Furuta asking Kaneki, him looking back on all of the decisions that he has made, all of his past mistakes, and to where he is currently in his life and wondering, has it all been for nothing? Is everything in vain with all of the decisions that I have made? But once I started to read this chapter again and again, and I sat on this chapter, 
This question can also be directed at Furuta to where he might be doing some self-reflection and thinking about the current state and situation that he is in and specifically thinking about that dream sequence, that family scenario with Rize. He's probably wondering right now, everything that I have done, all of the decisions that I have made, has it all amounted to nothing? Has it all been in vain? This is a very interesting question to be asked within this scenario, and I am hoping that this isn't the only scene we have with Kaneki and Furuta having a conversation. I am hoping we go back to this because this was too short to end off that fight we had just with this one question conversation being talked about between Kaneki and Furuta because the rest of this chapter deals with the CCG owl going up against the V organization, so I am hoping that with chapter 176, or at least some chapters in the future, we come back to this particular moment and we get to continue off the conversation between Kaneki and Furuta. Plus, I am also wondering, where is Rize when all of this is going down? Because she has not popped up since she got out of Dragon, and I'm really curious when she's going to play a role or if she is going to play a role. So that is basically the section we have between Kaneki and Furuta within this chapter, which left me a little bummed, but then everything else we got in this chapter was surprising with reveal after reveal after reveal. So we return to the front lines with the CCG, and we come to see that Mitsuki has detained the taxidermied owl. It has ceased its movements, which basically goes to infer that since the Nato has died, it no longer has control over the taxidermied owl. And this eventually leads into the revival of Eto later on in this chapter, but I'll get to talking about that just a little bit later. But this is where we start to get our first reveal with this chapter, where we see the Devil Apes and the Black Dobers make a return in this chapter ever since they kind of disappeared during the underground arc because we see them return and attack the CCG on the front lines. And I think many people were wondering, wait a minute, what is going on with the Devil Lates and the Black Dobers? Why are they attacking the CCG? And then we have this shot of Keiko right behind Koma and Arimi to where he basically looks like a puppet master getting ready to control his puppets. And we come to learn that Arimi and Koma have been made into autonomous humanoid ghouls. These are Quinkes that can walk and talk. They are very similar to that of the Quink Squad, except what Kano has been able to do here is that he's ripped the free will out of the individual, and now the V organization can control these ghouls remotely and tell them where to go, what to do, and who to attack. So that is currently the situation that we have with the Dobers and the Apes, but there is one question that has to be raised within your mind during this section, it's that Kano, there's no way he had enough time to implement this from when the Dobers and the Apes disappeared during the underground arc to where they reappear now. He needed a lot more time to implement this technology and perfect this technology. And this is where the theory comes from because I got this from the comments section of my live reaction from Sparta Blizzard. And after looking at that theory and really rereading this section, it really starts to line up to where Arimi and Koma have been dead for quite some time. The Dobers and the Apes have been dead since part one the ending of Tokyo Ghoul, and during that time skip, Kano has been experimenting on them and implementing the autonomous humanoid Quinke technology within their bodies. And then once they resurged into the story during the Rue Island arc, they were already puppets under the control of the V organization. And they were able to fool everyone around them just to say, it's like, yeah, we survived. That was not the case. They actually have been dead this entire time. And when you really look at Keiko's dialogue during this section of the chapter, he states, I'm glad they haven't rotted yet. Basically alluding to that these are dead bodies that he is controlling, and then he goes on to say, had fun in that alliance on the island, young scone. Basically saying, since Rue Island, they have fooled you this entire time. This is crazy technology to be implementing this late in the game in Tokyo Gori, and it's amazing that Ishida can still surprise us with these reveals, but I really want to go back, you know, to those chapters. I wasn't able to go back to all of them, but I want to see if there were any clues indicating that Arimi and Koma might have been under the control of the V organization this entire time, and we just didn't notice the clues. So it's going to be very interesting to see if the Dobers and the Apes can be saved from this situation, and I'm very curious to see if Arimi and Koma are in fact dead within this situation, because I can still be proven wrong, but just with the information we have right now, it's alluding to the fact that Koma and Arimi have been dead for quite some time. 
But we end up ending off this section with the Dobers and the Apes by seeing Koma and Arimi attacking Haraka, Ui, and Mugen, which really brought me back to part one of Tokyo Ghoul when we had the CCG going through with the Enteku raid. I really do like that little parallel and callback to the ending of part one. But then we end up moving into Keiko's part of this chapter. And this part really just go to emphasize once again that Keiko is strong and you should not mess with him. Do not take him lightly because he is taking everyone on in this chapter. We see Keiko begin to fodernize all of these nameless investigators as he is decapitating them left and right with his quinque that he is alluding to being made from Mr. Yoshimura. He has a Kuzin quinque at his disposal and that's a pretty powerful quinque to have. But the quinque is only as powerful as the person that wields it and this chapter goes to show, once again, Keiko is no pushover because he is pushing every single person that fights back against him, he pushes them back. Juzo, Juzo Squad, the QS Squad, Little Arima, Yomo, Nishiki, and Tsukiyama, all of them are fighting back against Keiko, but they are not budging him in the slightest. But that makes a lot of sense to me because every single one of these people fighting back against Keiko is absolutely exhausted. They have been fighting non-stop these past 30 to 40 chapters ever since the middle of the underground arc up until this very moment. Juzo fought Kaneki for crying out loud and is still pushing forward. Mitsuki fought the rest of the QS squad, Toka, and then the QS squad went on to fight all of those ghouls coming from Dragon. Yomo fought Uta and he is still going in. And Tsukiyama and Nishiki were fighting back against the taxidermied owl and they are still giving it their all. All of these people, absolutely exhausted, and they are still trying to go in against Keiko. It is impressive to see. But Keiko ain't budging in the slightest, and he's even beginning to mock them by saying, every last one of you are just pigeons of Kuzin. And this is when we get the second of the three reveals that we have in this chapter, where we begin to see Owl begin to move a little bit, sneaks up behind Keiko, and just slashes his right arm off. Nani? Surprise, motherfucker. Eto is alive and well and apparently has the hacked regen ability to regrow her head plus hair from the stump that was her neck. I knew Eto had OP regen abilities because we saw her regrow the bottom half of her body when Kaneki cut her in half, but to do a head plus hair, that right there is impressive, but I honestly was not too upset getting to see that Eto was still alive in this chapter, and in all honesty, if Ashida was planning on reintroducing Eto into the story, this panel of seeing Eto flip off Keiko was an excellent way to do so. But then, not even a few panels later, on the bottom of this same page, we see the return of Naki's character, and he begins to lead a counterattack of white suits against the V organization, and he's catching Keiko off guard. This is a badass double page spread to end this chapter off on, and the art looks amazing. I love that grin coming from Naki, but I still have mixed feelings on seeing Naki alive in this chapter, as well do many other people that read Tokyo Ghoul, because like I just said, it's a badass double spread page, and I like seeing Naki alive. It definitely shocked me, but I kind of like seeing him alive, but I also don't because I feel like this diminishes his demise that we kind of saw in chapter 140 because that would have been the perfect send off for Naki's character. Him going out in the blaze of glory, protecting his comrades and friends, making sure that they have a future, and he was going out thinking of Yamori about almost seeing Yamori very, very soon. And I kind of feel having him alive within this chapter and seeing him, it diminishes what we saw at the ending of that chapter. And I feel like many other people feel the same way, but I guess Ashida just loves using sensu beans and revives because he has been reviving characters left and right. And this has been a little bit of a problem I guess I've had with Tokyo Ghoul. It's not a major one, but I kind of feel that Ashida doesn't really feel like killing off a lot of the main characters that have been a staple within Tokyo Ghoul. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's killed off characters before. Kuriowa, Roma, Arima, he's killed off characters. There's no doubt about that. Donato being the most recent one. But I feel like for our main cast, people that have stayed around the longest, specifically for the ones that have been around since part one, I feel like he has a tough time killing them off because we've had a lot of fake outs to where people, we thought they died, and then they come back. That's my only real negative I've really had in recent months with Tokyo Ghoul. 
but it is what it is at this point because I just love making the joke that <laughs> Sheeta's basically like this Pokemon master using max revives on all of his characters, but that is the ending of this chapter, just seeing the white suits moving in and they are catching the V organization off guard. And that's where we end this chapter. So I'm very curious to see what we're going to be getting next week with chapter 176 because it's going to be on the cover of Young Jump. We're getting a color page and we're getting a big announcement for Tokyo Ghoulry. And I'm very curious to see what that is going to be, whether it's going to be a new series spinoff or if he's announcing the end of the series, I really don't know. But I am very excited to see what we're going to be getting and where we're going to move forward with the story because still a lot of unanswered questions, specifically, where the hell is Rize? When is Rize gonna pop up? I want Rize to pop up. So those are my thoughts, guys, on the latest chapter of Tokyo Ghoul Read, chapter 175. I'm really curious about hearing your guys' thoughts, so leave your thoughts down in the comments below, your positive, your negatives. Did you agree with me? Did you disagree with me? I'm really curious to hear your guys' thoughts, so leave those down in the comments below. And if you guys want to talk more about Tokyo Ghoul Read outside of YouTube, feel free to follow me on Twitter. A link for that can also be found in the description down below. That's going to do it for me here, guys. So until next week, when we have chapter 176 of Tokyo Ghoulry, I'll talk to you guys next time.